How's everybody doing today? Awesome, good, good, yeah, woo. All right, so we got technical difficulties going. So here's the thing. I want you to not rely on this today. I'm gonna have you just ask that you don't rely on this, and that means that if you have a phone, automatically I'm gonna ask that you get your Bible app out and that you go ahead and whip that bad boy out. Or if you have a paper Bible, because you're like, you're like, man, I love the Bible and I love the feeling of crisp paper in my hand. Uh, then I ask you to get that out, because we're gonna work through some things today and this may or may not, based on what's happening back there, this may or may not stay on. <laughs> Even if it comes on in the next few minutes, I can't promise you it's going to stay on. And so we want to still engage the scriptures with one another because we believe at this moment, what we're doing is we're heading into a time of worship that doesn't look like singing, but rather looks like us opening this book, right? And, and in these words, we're going to read them and we're going to engage them. And as we engage these words, we believe God, through the Holy Spirit, is going to meet us as we engage these words. And he's going to work in our lives, and he's going to open our minds to things and change our hearts in ways. And, and that's actually what the aim is of today. And so we can still do that with or without a screen, but we do that anytime we open the Bible and start to read those words. And I want to make that point again. Some of you are looking over here, and like I said, I want you to try and break away from this one and put your, put your eyes on this one for a moment because that doesn't require this screen or this place. The type of, of, of action, the type of progression, the type of experience or interaction with God that I'm describing is not one that comes when we look at the screen and read the Bible and do this on Sunday morning. It's what happens when we open the word of God and say, God, meet me today through these words. You can do that at home. You can do that here. You can do that anywhere. And so that's why today we don't need this screen to continue on. And if it goes in and out, I'm asking you to please just try to focus back and say, okay, God, help me be here. Help me engage with these words. And engaging with these words, Father, help to shape and mold me. Does that sound good? All right, because I promise you this is fixing to turn on. And then like 10 minutes later, it's going to be like, all right, y'all, I'll see you in a little bit. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do today, as I mentioned, continuing our time in worship. If you don't know me, my name is Josh. I serve as the lead pastor here at Refuge. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to start a new sermon series today entitled The Heart. Everybody say The Heart. The Heart. That's really good. What are we doing? Are we talking about the biological heart? Are we fixing to go through full-on pre-med? No, we're not. No, we're not going to do that. Realistically, what we're doing <coughs> is we're using this idea of the heart to try and create like a bit of a, a communication mechanism to get us thinking about that which we believe oftentimes or that we, we normally say comes from the heart. And what do we say comes from the heart most times? Even if you want to take a crack at it? Okay, there's evil. We'll, talk, we'll get to that in a second. Um, emotions. Emotions, that was the one. Um, emotions, right? Usually we'll say like, oh, emotions come from this place or the heart or the mind or different ways that we perceive it. But, but yeah, we're going to use this idea of, darn it, that's, oh, yeah, it is there. Okay, so we're going to use this idea of the heart to really focus in over the next several weeks on the idea of emotions. Now, here's the thing. For some of us, we hear that and right away we're starting to be like a little bit anxious because the idea of emotions especially in the context of Christianity, is actually really intimidating to us. It's really scary. Uh, some of us have had bad experiences with that. Maybe you went to a, uh, a place where the uh, act of being emotional during worship was expected, and so maybe you felt some pressure at places like a, a church that said, hey, I need you to give more, cry out more, like, man, stay in this moment until you, like, feel God. And it was like, dude, I'm pretty sure I feel God. I just, like, I just don't cry, you know. <laughs> And then they were like, no, you got to cry. And so, like, some of us have that intimidation. And, and then on top of that, right, some of us have taken uh, spaces like, man, Jeremiah 17.9 uh, that says the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? And we take that and we go, man, the, the, the heart maybe is, and emotions are kind of like have an enemy or antagonistic type of position in my life, right? They lead me this way, they lead me that way, when ultimately I'm trying to follow the truth. And so it's not the heart that's a good guy, it's the, the, the thought, the mind that's a good guy, the truth will be the thing that guides me. So that's some of us, and if that's you, fair enough, right? But on the other side, there's also another group of us that sees or, or, or perceives the idea of emotions, and we're like, yeah, now we're talking, right? Because we see emotions as like a compass for us. Right, we live by the gut, and so you start thinking to yourself, like, man, what I feel—that's how God is like showing me different things, and and He's like really kind of 
ushering me through my life, through these sensations and through these things that I'm feeling. And, and sometimes I call it intuition. And so for you, what's right when you feel it is right. And there's like nothing that can change your mind. But then when, when you feel something is wrong, right, likewise, you're like, no, that's absolutely wrong. Why? Because I'm feeling that thing of like, man, that's wrong, that's right. And so we see, right, on that side that the emotions are kind of like a compass for us. The reality is most often that emotions are probably somewhere in the middle of that. Emotions more realistically are somewhere in the middle of that. Uh, and when we kind of put them in this really, really kind of uh, wide spectrum and say emotions are either like really, really bad or they're like the ultimate good, right? Usually it's because we just need to take a little more time to try and figure out what emotions are, where they come from, how God wants to use them. We want to really more than, than kind of pit them against one another, pit them on a side of good versus bad. What we want to do is we want to try and figure out what does God want to do in our emotional lives, right? That, that's more realistically what's happening here. And, and here's the thing. This is important because uh, the idea of understanding our emotional lives is critical because none of us are going to avoid emotion. I don't care who you are in here. None of us are going to avoid emotion. Maybe you're a little more given to emotions than someone else. And when I say that, I mean, maybe you're a little more given to strong emotions than someone else. If I, I, I mean, anybody in here knows that that's true of me, right? Like uh, my dad watching me watch the Arsenal soccer team game yesterday can tell you that I was, uh, I was very intensely involved and I had a lot of strong and high emotion. All right. Uh, Josh was texting me during the, Arsenal, during the Austin FC game on Friday night. He had a lot of emotion, a lot of capital letters in those text messages, right? Uh, and so maybe you're given to that. And maybe you're like, no, 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 I'm not the exclamation point person, right? I'm, I'm a consistent period. Regardless of which camp you find yourself in or anywhere in between, you're going to engage in emotion. You're not going to be able to avoid them. You're going to be in that moment where you open your social media feed and you see that picture of a group of friends. And maybe you weren't invited and maybe you feel like you're messing out and you feel that, that bit of jealousy pop up inside of you. Right, you're going to be in those moments where you're feeling very stressed out at work, at home, in certain relationships, and you start to respond in anger and frustration. Right, you're going to have that moment where you feel like you're disagreeing with someone about something you feel passionate about, and you feel that urge of like, like justice and, and wanting to tackle something that you don't feel is right, and, and you're, going to, you're going to experience that. Oh, but at the same time, maybe, maybe again, you're the less deep, less, not deep, but less strong emotional response. So maybe for you, the main emotion you've been feeling is kind of that seeping, sneaking feeling of just numbness, right? Maybe you're not the person that feels these strong pulls of emotion, but maybe you are the person that's like, man, I don't remember the last time I really felt something in a while. The main thing I feel is numb. None of us are going to avoid emotion. None of us. And that's important, friend, because we're not called to maybe figure all that out, maybe None of us are really going to at the end of the day. But the thing is, we're called to at least try and understand it a bit better. And part of our calling is to try and understand that emotional life a bit better. And the reason is primarily because when we understand our emotional life a bit better, we tend to get a bit of clarity regarding what God is actually wanting to do in our lives. When we understand our emotional lives a bit better, we tend to get a bit of clarity regarding what God is actually doing in our lives. Right? And I'm not saying that emotions tell us what God is doing. I'm not saying that God exclusively communicates through emotions. But rather, when we begin to understand this network of feelings, why we're feeling them, how we're feeling them, the things that are prompting them from our past, things that are prompting them from our present, all of a sudden we get this clear picture of maybe God wants to work in my life this way. Maybe God wants to work in my life that way. Maybe he's pulling me here. Maybe he's leading me there. Right. And, and, and so the more we understand, the better we understand that emotional life within us, the better and clearer we'll generally be able to see like, hey, here's what God is working in my heart right now. Here's what God is doing in my heart right now. And that means the inverse is also true. Let me be honest with you. The, the less that we understand our emotional life, again, not that everyone is going to understand their emotional life in the same way, because that's also not true. Everyone's emotions are different and everyone's responses are different. But the less we try and understand Again, I'm not saying you have to have a full grasp on your emotions, but the less we try to understand where we are emotionally, the less we try to understand where we are uh, with how we're responding to things, 
I would go so far as to say, friend, maybe the less we be, the less clarity we get in understanding what God is doing in our life. And so understanding or trying to understand, giving ourselves to understanding our emotional life is going to be extremely important in our spiritual life. And here's the thing. Some of us have gotten ourselves in positions where we don't understand what's going on in our hearts emotionally. We don't understand what's happening in our hearts like, like negatively or positively. And then we begin to put on layers like, like devotion to God trying to live a life that's righteous, trying to live a life that's pleasing to God, or maybe even kind of some empowering ideas like, like, man, you're loved by God unconditionally, right? You're affirmed by God. God accepts you. But we haven't figured out why our emotions respond to some of these ideas in certain ways. And so all of a sudden, we start burdening ourselves in ways that are unhealthy and hurtful in response to good Christian doctrine. Again, the ideas themselves aren't bad. No one here would look at me and be like, God loving me is not a good thing. But yet when we're wrestling with the idea that God loves you right where you are, right where you've been, he's here to save you. He's meeting you right where you are. And all of a sudden emotionally we're like, nah, man, nah, nah. I mean, like I need to like be a little bit better before I go to God. All of a sudden when we don't understand our emotional lives, we don't understand what God is doing. And all of a sudden those good things can become burdens to us. Right? They can actually become hurtful. There's a man named Peter Scazzaro, and he's written several books on the idea of emotional health in the area of spirituality. And he says this, that the Christian, if we can get it up here, that's going to be really great. But the cri Christian spirituality, uh, basically unhinged or unconnected, we're not, uh, unconnected from emotional maturity, right, can be deadly. I want you to hear what I'm saying again because I know we're kind of focused on that. That Christian spirituality disconnected from emotional maturity can be deadly to you, to your relationship with God, and to your relationship with others. If I'm not mistaken, I got that quote on the money without anything in front of me. And I'm really impressed with myself right now. But, right, that idea is powerful. That if we just burden ourselves with Christian actions but never understand what God wants to do in the heart, all of a sudden they become burdens, not blessings to us. And so this entire series is going to be built for the idea of helping us understand emotion, helping us understand where they come from, what they're meant to do, maybe how God wants to use them. And each we're going to do that by going each week into kind of a negative emotional experience. And through exploring that negative emotional experience, we're going to tease out a bit of what kind of general ideas about emotional life. Along the way, we're definitely going to encounter some tips and some ways to, to kind of say, hey, practically, how do we navigate through this type of negative emotional experience? And, and really, I'm hoping that this can be an impactful time spiritually to help us see, okay, maybe God is working in my life like this. Maybe God wants to do these things. Maybe I'm learning about what God wants to do in me as I understand what I'm doing emotionally and what's going on in my heart, right? And then also in a very practical way, when we're kind of there to say, man, when I respond like this, I think it might be related to this. I think it might be related to that. I want to encourage you to be uh, kind of in during these times, but also to plug into a community group as we'll walk out a lot of these practical elements of these questions and these topics in that space week in and week out. And overall, I'm really excited about the next several weeks. Today, though, what we're going to do is we're just going to start off with kind of an introduction. Oh, darn it, that's not there. Uh, <laughs> I had to remind you all to not be dependent on it as much as I need to not be dependent on it. Uh, we're going to start out, we're kind of just like an introduction to the idea of emotions biblically. Right, biblically. So what, what theologically does it mean to have emotions and what theologically does it mean for them to be, what are the characteristics, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to use a moment in Jesus' life where he has one of the most vivid neg like experiences with what we would describe as a negative emotion. And we're going to kind of from there tease out what does this tell us about emotions at large? What does this tell, about, tell us about emotions, the fact that Jesus is experiencing this? What can we learn from uh, this experience that Jesus has? And so with that... I want to bring this a little closer this time because uh, I don't have the, you know, the screen to get me my, uh, my Bible. But we're going to reread John 11, and we're going to start at verse 33 this time. And we're going to read that, and I want to, you to just kind of digest some of that, and then we're going to break a little bit of it down. Verse 33 starts, when Jesus saw her crying, that's Mary, and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? 
For those of you that don't know where this story is taking place, we're taking a little, uh, a, a little snippet of a story. We're, we're kind of zoning in on it, but it takes place within the context of a bigger story, and that is the story of Lazarus. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus's, uh, and, and he gets word from a friend, right, from a messenger uh, that, hey, G, uh, Lazarus is dying, right? He's dying. He's sick. It's pretty serious, and they say, Jesus, can you come? And while we don't have time to get into it today, Jesus waits a couple of days, and they're like, shouldn't we leave? The disciples are like, shouldn't we head out? And Jesus is like, ah, he's going to be all right. Uh, and then he, he packs up, and he heads over, and he finds Lazarus uh, and his family, Mary and Martha. And, and when he gets there, uh, they see Jesus coming, and they run back to the house and say, he's here. And at that instant, Mary runs out, and she greets Jesus. And when she greets him, uh, that's where we pick up our story, where she looks at him and says, he's, he's gone. He's hurting. Uh, now he's hurting, but he's, he's dead. We called you several days ago, and you weren't here. And that's tough. I, we'll, we'll, there's a sermon from like an Easter ago where I, I pick up on this a little bit, but I mean, you got to remember, they sent a messenger right where Jesus was. So they knew exactly where he was. They knew how many days it would take him to get there. And they looked at him and was like, he's gone. I know you could have been here three days earlier. It's tough. And Jesus responds in our story, show me where you've laid him. And they take him over. And Jesus sees all the people crying. He sees his friend Mary crying. And the scriptures say he was moved in the spirit and troubled. And he wept and he cried. Let me level with you, because maybe you're like me. This isn't necessarily how I picture Jesus. I'm a very aggressive man. I'm going to be frank about that. I'm a very aggressive individual. I don't know why people had to laugh at that. <laughs> it makes me feel like maybe I'm a little too aggressive sometimes. But <laughs> I'm a very aggressive man. And so oftentimes the Jesus that I picture is this very aggressive, like, like overcoming king. So when I picture my sin... And I picture even the idea of death, the most comforting thing to me is honestly not Jesus weeping. It's Jesus resurrecting and being like, I put everything under my feet, including death. Sin ain't going to win. I'm going to win everything. I've already done it. The cross is my victory. And I'm like, yeah, Jesus, right? Like, that's like, and hallelujah. For some of us, that gets us going. And we're like, man, I connect to that Jesus. That's the way I like to picture Jesus. One of the ways I struggle to picture Jesus is him at the tomb of his friend just crying. That's a really hard way for me to imagine Jesus. That the victor and the creator of everything, the one who would overcome death and overcome sin, is amongst his friends at the foot of the tomb where his good friend now lies lifeless. And instead of just being like, it's all going to be good. Don't worry about that. Your boy's here. I am the resurrection. You don't got to worry about it. He just sits there and he just cries. And it says I was, he was moved in his spirit and he was troubled. You know what that means in Greek is that he was moved in his spirit and he was troubled. It's not like some weird phrasing. It's just that he was sad. He was hurt. And here's the thing, friend. This is a little bit weird, but I think it's exactly in this moment that we get to tease out a little bit about kind of like what this can tell us about emotion. Right? When we see Jesus in this deep experience with a negative emotion, this is where we get to start to tease out what is this what is this telling us about our own emotions, our own experiences with emotion? The first thing that I would say, friend, is that it tells us that emotions are from God. Emotions are from God. Hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying that every emotion is from God. I'm not saying that every single emotion you feel is from God, and therefore it is the voice of God telling you where you should go or what you should do. But rather, what I am saying is that the act of feeling is from God. Right? He feels, therefore we feel. The act of feeling is something that gives us or empowers us, I should say, to live out what it means to, to be made in his image and to display his character and to display his love. Because the same way he feels about something, we feel in that same way. Again, not that all of our feelings are exactly what God feels. Not that all of our feelings are God saying, hey, this is like a, your feeling, I'm guiding you with this feeling. But the act of feeling, having a network of emotions, feeling different ways to different things, right? The actual act of emoting, having a feeling, that's from God, right? God has given that to us because he himself 
actually does that. And friend, this is, this is critical. I think this is, this is really important because if, if I'm being honest with you, right, for some of us, um, this idea of, of emotions, again, as I mentioned earlier, can be really scary. It can be really challenging. It, it's this idea that when we feel something, sometimes we get scared of an emotion. Sometimes we get scared of feeling a certain way. And so we run the other direction. We kind of resist the idea of feeling at all. We try to cover ourselves and protect ourselves from feelings. And all of a sudden, when we're put into this type of context, we start to realize that maybe the feelings themselves aren't the issue. Maybe feelings aren't a bad thing. Maybe all of a sudden when we look and see that God himself in the flesh is crying at a tomb, that it's not the worst thing in the world to cry. Hear me, friends. Some of us in here probably need to be reminded that your so feelings of sorrow are not always going to be a bad thing. Your feelings of mourning are not always going to be a bad thing. Your feelings of anger are not always going to be a bad thing. And those of you that feel alone in your feelings, remember and be reminded that the king of the world and the creator of all things sat at his friend's tomb and wept. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly how you're feeling. He knows what it felt like to look at his mom and be worried at his crucifixion and to try and pair his mom up with his boy and say, can y'all take care of each other? Right? He understands what it means to be human and to be God, and, and he recognizes what you're going through. Friend, emotions are from God. The act of, of being emotional is from God. It's a, it's a gift. The second thing that, that we get to take from this text, friend, is that Jesus is our perfect example of emotion. Jesus is our perfect example, right? Like, when we look at Jesus in this moment, sometimes maybe it's hard for you to, to imagine, like it is me, that Jesus just sitting there crying, that he's just sitting there weeping. But friends, here's the thing. What does love do when he, when he sees a group full of people hurting and sad and mourning someone that they've lost. Love weeps. Love weeps. Right? Love sees the reality of someone's heart and begins to weep with them. He sees the pain. He sees the sorrow. And he engages by saying, man, I'll weep with you. Why? Because what was value to you, valuable to you is now gone. What was, what was valuable to you as a brother, what was valuable to you as a relationship, what was valuable to you as that person you say good morning to, what was valuable to you as that person you crack a joke with, and all the little inside jokes that compound over the course of a lifetime are now in a tomb laying lifeless. And you're mourning and you're sad, and love doesn't respond by saying, like, man, why are you even worried about that? Like, I'm here. Love responds by weeping. Jesus is a perfect example of what it looks like to have our emotions Right, to understand what our emotions are doing, to understand how they actually are working, and then to respond to them well. And here's the thing. Some of us are like, man, but Jesus was God, but Jesus was also human. Right, the beautiful idea in the Bible is that while Jesus is 100% God, he's also 100% man. Meaning he's 100% God, but he's also 100% human. And so all of the things you go through, he's gone through, he just knows how to navigate them perfectly. He just navigates them perfectly. He navigates them with humility and dependence and understanding where his heart is and what his heart's doing. And so he recognizes maybe right there is going to be a resurrection here. In fact, in about five minutes, I'm fixing to bring this man back to life because I'm Jesus. But then he also recognizes the sorrow and mourning that's present, right, is not meant to be shamed. It's meant to pronounce the value of this man. And my weeping will likewise pronounce the value of this friend because he was my friend too. And so Jesus weeps along with those that are weeping. What a beautiful example of what it means to understand emotion, even when you are above and, ab above and more powerful than the thing that's providing or evoking the emotion, and then to do it well, right, to navigate through it perfectly. Friend, these two points that we're starting with, I think they're kind of the backbone of what we need to understand because really what we're laying out now is that emotions, the act of feeling, right, is from God, and Jesus perfectly displays what it means to emote and to have feelings and to work through them perfectly and in a beautiful way. But this idea that feelings have come from God is something that we sometimes tend to back away from and get a little bit nervous by, right? Some of us, we look at emotions and we don't think that the act of emoting or the act of feeling is always good. In fact, we've labeled some things as bad emotions and some things as good emotions. And so we don't really understand that emotions have come from God at all sometimes. 
right? Like, like really, to be 100% honest with you, some of us in here would see Jesus knocking over uh, tables in the temple and forming a whip and being like, get out of here. And we'd be like, man, that doesn't sound right to me, right? That, that seems a little bit off. I'm not sure if I like that version of Jesus without recognizing that it wasn't from God that that emotion came. It was from your experience with violence and, and, and hurtful behavior in your past and in your life. And so you're bringing that into the moment, looking and saying, man, that type of action rubs me the wrong way. And therefore, that type of feeling is a feeling that I deem as bad. And then some of us are on the other side, right? We see Jesus in there doing that. We're like, yeah, like I said, I'm an aggressive guy. And I ain't going to lie. Sometimes I'm reading the Bible and I see Jesus flipping tables and calling Pharisees broods of vipers. And I'm like, man, I'm in love with this guy, dude. I'm a big fan. But that's, maybe that's because I grew up in an aggressive environment. And maybe my aggressive environment shaped me to think, okay, this is how you, this is how you get by. This is how you survive. So what we don't realize is in that moment as we approach something like aggressive behavior, we're not bringing everything that, we're not bringing the emotions as, as gifts from God, but we don't even realize we're bringing all the experiences, all the things that have actually like, like, like we, that have shaped us and that have formed us, and that now we, we stand in a moment and we're sitting there going, okay, how am I feeling? What am I doing? And we don't understand it. We're not understanding that, man, the act of feeling is a gift from God, or maybe we're under, kind of under the influence of thinking every one of my feelings is from God, and instead of understanding the entire backdrop of, hey, this is all the things that have happened to me here, all the things that have shaped who I am, here's all of what goes into this moment and how I respond emotionally to this event event, all the while we've missed the point that, man, Jesus, God has given us the act of feeling because it comes from him. We don't always, we don't always get that, right? We don't always, we don't always, we miss the mark with that sometimes. But also we have the opportunity to look at someone like Jesus and say, hey, this is the perfect example of what emotions should look like. And, and here's the deal with that, right? I'm, I'm laboring on this point a little bit because it's in the midst of this that God still wants to work. When I said God works through our emotional environment, maybe in the midst of both those feelings, when they're looking at the aggressive behavior, God wants to step in and say, I want to affirm that gentleness is valuable, but I also want to affirm that discipline is powerful in a person's life as well. And maybe the person that struggles with aggressive behavior needs to be affirmed, hey, there's such thing as godly anger. But maybe the person that is a little bit too comfortable with aggressive behavior needs to be affirmed, hey, the actual feeling of gentleness and being gentle in the midst of something is beautiful for for the person receiving your correction, receiving your love. And in the midst of it, when we don't recognize that these things are from God and that Jesus can perfectly navigate them, we fail to realize that it's in that spiritual space that God actually begins to show us who he is. He begins to show us, you know what, there's such a thing as godly anger that leads to righteousness. There's such a thing as gentleness, like weeping alongside of your friends, despite knowing I can handle this. Right, there, there's an emotional reality that comes from the goodness of God that, that is his character, that is his promise, that shows who he is, that we get to tap into and say, God, I don't know every, to every minute of every day what's happening in my heart, but I know what's happening in me is a result of who you are. And so I want to look more like you so God helps shape me from the inside out. Help shape what I'm, what I'm feeling, what I'm seeing, what I'm understanding inside and use that in order to really kind of direct my life and show me what you want to show me and guide me how you want to guide me. And so emotions, right, these emotions that we're encountering, that you're encountering today, and they, they're, they come from God, right? The act, all this big network of feelings you have, they come from God. And ultimately we find the perfect example of them in the person of Jesus, just living his life, just being himself. Why? Because, again, none of us are going to avoid emotion. It's going to be a part of every single one of our lives every single day. And we get to look at Jesus and go, here's what you're doing here. Here's the last thing I want to point out about emotion from this text. It's that emotion, uh, emotions are connected to love. Emotions are connected to love. Take a minute to consider, I think it's verse 34 here, um, and it says this. Oh, this is nice. Um, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. I want you to think about what's happening here. Jesus is at a tomb. 
He's weeping. He's sorrowful. And the people around Mary looked and said, see how he loved him. Now, right after this, there was also a group of people that were like, man, had he been here, couldn't you just raise him? We're not worried about that group. We're worried about this group. The group that saw the sorrow of Jesus and connected it back to, man, he loved, he loved Lazarus deeply. Here's the thing, friend. Your emotions, one of the most powerful things we're going to pick up through the course of this series is that your emotions are connected to what you love. Your emotions are connected to what you love. Jesus loved Lazarus. He loves Martha and Mary. And in the midst of that context, around people that he loves that are filled with anguish, that are filled with sorrow, Jesus weeps. He loves them. In our lives, a lot of the things that we're responding to, a lot of the things that we're having emotional reactions to, they're related to things that we love. Right, basic examples can be used here, right? Like, if you love affirmation and someone rejects you, what happens? You're very disappointed. Right, if you love affirmation and someone is like, man, you're the best. All of a sudden, we're like, dude, I'm on cloud nine right now, right? Maybe if you love uh, attention, right, if you love influence, all of a sudden, if you're in the limelight, you feel really good. But then if you're, like, you see someone else in the limelight, all of a sudden, you're very disappointed, Right, if you love items, if you love materialism or security, right, maybe you fall in love with the idea of buying more things, surrounding yourself with a nice car or a nice house, and that makes you feel very secure and very safe. But the moment those things are taken away, what happens? You're filled with a sense of anxiety and a sense of sorrow. Now remember and realize that material items, a house, a car, standing under some lights, right, uh, being accepted or affirmed by someone, none of those things are evil in and of themselves. None of those things are bad. I drive a car. I like my house. I'm standing under a light right now, right? Like none of those things are inherently evil in and of themselves. Yet when we begin to say, I love that thing. And here's the thing, not just I love that thing, but man, I need that thing. I love that thing with an affection that begins to tell me that's the thing I really need. That's the thing I really want. That, that love starts to whisper to me, this is the type of, of, of uh, fulfilling, satisfying element that you desperately need. So you have to have it. You have to have the affirmation. You have to have the house. You have to have the limelight. You have to have the acceptance. Those are often the times our emotions become unhinged. And the reason Jesus perfectly navigates emotions is because he never loves anything more than he loves his father. His emotions are perfect. Why? Because he loves perfectly. Here's the thing, friend. I want you to realize something. I want you to look at me, and I want you to try to pay attention to what I'm saying. You may look at your emotional health, and maybe you think about it a lot. You may look at your emotional life, and you may not think about it at all, right? And maybe you look at it and think, I'm doing pretty good here. Maybe you look at it and think, man, I'm not doing very well here. I kind of don't know what's happening emotionally for me. The reality, friend, is that sometimes when we perceive that our emotions are out of whack, it's not because we're feeling bad feelings. The feeling of sorrow is not a bad feeling. Jesus loves the people that he's with. He's sorrowful because they're dead. He's sorrowful because they're hurting. And he experiences something that communicates the depth of his love for his friends. That's not evil. In fact, that probably points to the beauty of how much Jesus loved another person and how we should therefore love one another. I hope that in this room, you look around and you're developing relationships with other people to where if one of the people in this room died, you would sit at the tomb and you would weep. That's not a bad feeling. In fact, it's, it's a beautiful feeling. It's a beautiful scene to see the creator of everything just say, man, I'm, I'm willing to weep with you. I'm willing to cry with you because of the depths of how much I love you. Yeah, I'm, I'm in control. Yeah, to be fair, I'm going to resurrect him, but, but I love you. And that's, this is coming from love. Emotional, our emotional lives, sometimes when we perceive them as unhealthy, it's not because we're experiencing negative emotions. Friends, it might be because what we love is a little bit off. It might be because of what we love is a little bit off, and therefore the emotions that are invading our life and the emotions that are, in, the emotions that are invading our heart and the emotions that are invading our mind are, are really linked to things that we love that are just a little bit faulty, that are just a little bit insecure that lack a lot of foundation, right? When your heart begins to unhinge itself from the proper place that it should have in loving God and in being loved by him 
and you're, you're, you're stepping away from saying what my heart needs, I want to find in you. And you're putting yourself in this place where you're saying, you know what, I really love all these other things. And now I'm going to venture out into the world and I'm, and I'm going to venture out into different social scenarios. I'm going to venture out into different business ventures. I'm going to venture out into different spaces where I can achieve different things in school or in business or anywhere else. And we start to, to develop this affection and this love for these things. The moment they're gone, the moment they're even in danger. I'm not even going to say the moment they're gone. The moment they're just vulnerable. Friend, all of a sudden you can feel that sense of, man, what's going to happen next? Am I going to lose the house? Am I going to lose, right, the, the job? Am I going to lose the, and again, loving those things is not bad. I'm not going to say loving them things are bad. Loving your house isn't bad. Loving your spouse isn't bad. Jesus loves his friends. They pass away. He's crying. Right? But loving them ultimately. Deriving what we need, our value from those things. Man, that can leave us on emotionally unstable ground, friend. Emotionally unstable ground. And right now, you know, maybe you're looking at this screen, this verse, and you're listening to what I'm saying, and you're like, man, this is hard. Because, of course, Jesus gets it. But I struggle with this. How do I even stop myself from overly loving something? How do I even stop myself from, from ultimately loving something? How do I even stop myself from saying, man, this thing is going to provide for me? Friend, one, that's what this series is for. That's why we're even here covering this subject. Because unless we have the space to actually think about what our heart is doing and think about where our emotions are, and think about what we're finding satisfaction in, and think about what we're finding fulfillment in, and think about where we are, and think about how we're trying to achieve and gain and, and satisfy ourselves where we are, we'll never understand how the gospel wants to step in and say, man, I, I already did that for you. Which is exactly why at the very beginning we said, man, when you understand what's happening in here, you begin to understand what God wants to do in your life, in your heart, in your mind. It takes stepping in and saying, what are my emotions doing? What do I love? How am I responding to what I love? How am I responding to the things that I hope bring me life and bring me security and bring me affirmation? How am I responding to that? That's why we're here. That's why we're doing this for the next several weeks. And hear me, friend, the beauty of talking about emotions talking about the heart in the context of the gospel is that we have a very short trip from what we long to to what's offered to us. I'm going to say it again. We have a very short trip from what our heart longs for to what's being offered to us. Because maybe in here you're saying, man, I want security. And then Jesus steps in and says, man, I've, I've actually secured glory for you. And then we go, man, no, 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 but I, I really want, like, people to affirm me. And then Jesus steps in and says, man, I, I actually lived the life pleasing to the Father, right, so that you could be affirmed by him. Man, but I, you don't understand. Like, I really, I'm really longing for a sense of, like, influence. You have the ability to step into a story of God shaping and molding the world where you carry the most powerful message of the most important human being in the history of everything in order to take into a community and to take into a, a town and to take into a city and begin to preach it and begin to share it and begin to invite people in and to see communities be shaped not by your message but rather by your efforts and relationships reliance on this beautiful message and what Jesus has done, man, everything that you long for has been captured in this person of Jesus. Why? Because he entered into our story. He entered into the emotional element of our story. When he goes to the cross, he doesn't go just to forgive your sins, friend. Yes, it's not less than that, but it's so much more than that as well. He earns the acceptance of God the Father so you could walk in the freshness and, and, and in the life of saying, I'm accepted by my God. He, he earns, uh, all of a sudden, he, he earns what it means to be secure as he, as he earns what it means to, to honor and love God and to please God, yet goes to the cross and surrenders that. The story of the gospel is the story of God knowing your heart better than you know your heart so that he could take and achieve what your heart desperately needs, go to the cross and say, now it's going to be yours. 
The invitation is not for you to go earn it anymore. The invitation is for you to come to me to receive it. And from there, we're going to begin to work out what it looks like for you to find what you need in me. And as you find what you need in me, I'm going to keep bringing you new life. And ultimately, when I return, it will all be made right and you will be fresh and you will be new and you'll be satisfied and everything will be finished. But keep working out what it means and what it looks like to find that life in me. Keep working out what it looks like to find to find that satisfaction in me. Keep working out what it looks like to find those needs in me. When you come to love something, I want to teach you how to properly love it the way Jesus loved it. Again, loving your house and loving your, your school and loving your achievements and loving those things are not bad. I love, I love getting on things three on my telephone. I don't know why I said telephone like I'm, you know, like this is the 70s. But on my cell phone, opening that app and just like working through a checklist of things, it gets me lit. I'm like, oh, man, I killed it today. The tension there is not enjoying checking off a list and, and feeling excitement from it. The tension there is not checking off everything from the list and feeling like I'm, I'm somehow missing something. And my own security can only be found at the end of the, the things three checklist. Right? That's, that's the tension. Friends, as we enter into the, the rest of this series, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm, I'm prayerful. That as we work through these emotions, as we work through these things, as we work through what it means to, to love well, what it, as we work through what it means to love like Jesus. Because, again, the, the point of the emotions is probably the same point of the scriptures. Right? The point of the scriptures is not to, to teach you a message that changes your mind about Jesus. That's not the point of the Bible. The point of the gospel is not to change your mind so that you think Jesus is good and I think that he's God. The point of, of, of Jesus himself is not to come in and say, hey, I want to prove to you the thing. The point of the gospel, the point of the scriptures, the point of Jesus' message and Jesus' own life is not to change your mind. The point of that message is to change your heart by changing what you love. It's why John says, man, I love you because you first loved me. The point of our emotions ultimately is not just to show us what we love on earth, but to point us to the depths of the, lo of the love of the one who created us and who's shaping us, and who's leading us, and who made us, and who wants to guide us, right? That's the ultimate point of our emotions. As we begin to work our emotions and understand how is it that you want to shape me and form me through my emotions, it most ultimately is going to end up at the place where you say, God, how do you want to point me to the depths of your own love in the things that I love? Friends, if we can get there through the course of the next several weeks, I'm telling you that it's going to be a powerful time where I'm praying the depths of your love for God is bolstered. But likewise, that, that, that your understanding and knowledge of God's love for you is deepened. And the result of that is often powerful life change and being filled with faith. But friends, it's going to take, di it's going to take diving into the idea of where are my emotions at and what are you trying to do in me? But friends, if we can get there. If you can go there with us, I'm praying and I'm hopeful. This will be a powerful time for you and a powerful time for me. Sound good? Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time today. Thank you, Father, um, that we recognize and humbly come before you, understanding that you are the creator of emotions, that you are the creator of our hearts. You know what we long for. You know what we want. Yet we recognize also, Father, that in our hands, emotions can be expressed wrongly. We can love inaccurately. We can love things that are lesser than the things you've called us to love. We can oftentimes love things that, um, in, in a way that puts far too much value on them and not enough value on you. Yet, Father, you invite us not to look at our heart and say you are the ultimate gauge and the ultimate judge on whether I'm accepted and loved, but rather you allow us and invite us to look at the person of Jesus the perfect example of how emotions work and what emotions should look like in the hands of a godly person and to find rest saying that Jesus has taken the mistakes that I've made emotionally to the cross so that in him I can find the emotional needs and values and, and, and things that I'm longing for and slowly begin to work those out. It won't be easy. And we confess today that it won't be. Yet our, our invitation is not to ease but our invitation is to find rest and comfort and peace in you as we embark on that journey together. And so, Father, over the next several weeks, help us to understand our hearts better. And ultimately, through that, Father, help us to understand your heart better. We love you. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.